Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter with HurricaneTrack.com here with your hurricane outlook and discussion for Monday, the 18th of June, 2018. Hope your Father's Day, if you are a father, was good yesterday. Mine was. Took the day off, really didn't do anything. Sometimes it's good to do that, especially when the tropics are quiet for the most part. Nothing pressing. But we're back today on Monday, and there is a lot to talk about. We'll start with the Southern Oscillation Index. And as you can see, we are losing uh, ground here in the 30-day. The 90-day also steadily has been coming down. And what does this mean? The Southern Oscillation Index helps me to understand the background state of the pressure pattern of the tropical Pacific. And the more negative these numbers are, the more El Nino base state we typically see. A strongly positive Southern Oscillation Index is more typical of something that fosters La Nina, or cooler than average in the tropical Pacific. So the daily numbers, you know, getting on down there, um, negative now in the 30-day, the 90-day still just slightly positive. So we're slowly eroding the pattern that gave us the La Nina last year. We're moving on through the neutral phase now as well, eroding that and heading more towards a warmer phase of the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And we can see that here on the subsurface chart that's updated recently. This is the Eastern Pacific on this side, the Western Pacific over here, and of course the Central Pack in the middle. And what we see is fairly solid warming all the way to the surface from this subsurface warm pool that will continue to fuel this for the next several months. Therefore, I guess we could deduce that by the fall and winter, we will probably be entering an El Nino event. That being said, all El Ninos are not created equal, and this is going to be a different type of El Nino, probably one that we refer to as a Madoki event. What is that? Well, stay tuned on Thursday. We're going to have a special guest as I continue this new sort of expansion of my universe, reaching out to other experts. And we're going to have somebody come on and talk about that. Who is it? You'll have to tune in Thursday to find out. And I do that because I don't know everything. And as I was messaging this person, I told them I know a lot. Uh, well, let me hold them back up. See, I already screwed it up. I know a little about a lot. And I'm more of a landfall and impact expert. I really know a lot about that. But I don't know everything about El Nino. I don't know everything about the physical thermodynamics of meteorology and Kelvin waves and Madden-Julian oscillations. And that's why we bring in other experts, and I call it phoning a friend. So we're going to do that on Thursday to borrow from the who wants to be a millionaire catchphrase. Anyway, back to the subject at hand. To me, this is really interesting as to why this has been here the whole time, for months and months and months, this little bowl of absolutely average, you know, right on the money, sea surface temperature, uh, not even an anomaly. It's just right where it should be, right through here. Uh, but you see, this is the area where we're really going to focus on. And so to see a warm event take shape by the fall and winter and into 2019 will not surprise me at this point. I still don't think that it is going to be substantial enough to put a lid on the Atlantic hurricane season. And I'll show you why as we get to the surface map. Let's get rid of some of these tabs. So here's what this looks like at the surface. Okay, If we go from the subsurface, and we see how this translate up, uh, translates up above, a little warm area right there, some more pools of warmth here, and that translates very well to what we saw in the subsurface. And then farther out to the west here, pretty much neutral for the most part. Notice that the eastern Pacific, right along the equatorial region, generally cooler than average, and in fact, if you go south of the equator, this is what we call the Nino 1 and 2 area. And we'll discuss this in more detail on Thursday as I set everything up for our guest. But this area of the eastern Pacific has actually cooled in the last week or so, while this area has warmed ever so slightly, just a couple of tenths of a degree Celsius or something like that. Nothing dramatic. But this area through here is really important because if this is not anomalously warm, you typically don't get a lot of rising air coming out of it that sinks and spreads across this area. And so you don't generate that much wind shear from it. 
So this is going to be an interesting setup because this El Nino that we're going to be transitioning closer towards is not going to be your traditional uh, basin-wide El Nino where everything across here is all warm like that. Remember what it looked like in 2015 and in 1997 where it was just basin-wide? No, we're not going to have that this time. So this is going to have some interesting implications on the hurricane season uh, for the Atlantic. Okay. So speaking of the Atlantic, notice in the main development region, I mean, look, I'm not making this up. I didn't add any pixels. This is, you, know, you can do whatever you want in Photoshop, right? I mean, this is right off the Noah Nesda site from today, and it's definitely warming up. And if you don't believe me, let's go back two weeks I mean, come on, there it was on June the 4th, and here it is now, especially right here. Pay attention to this area right here off the coast of Africa, between there and the Cape Verde Islands. Yeah. Now, is this a dramatic warming? I don't know what the classification for dramatic is. To me, it shows that the MDR is warming overall, and in some cases, as we can see on today's chart, anomalously so. More so than normal. So will it be enough to change the season to where it's going to be very active? I don't think so. But I saw a tweet from Dr. Ryan Maui kind of echoing what I've been saying that just because it's colder than average now, A, doesn't mean that it will be by August, late August especially, and B, the water temperatures are still going to be plenty warm to generate hurricane activity and if it's not immediately off the coast of Africa, then it will be once you get west of about 40 longitude and beyond. And who lives there? We do. Nobody lives on a landmass out here because there aren't any. So if there's no hurricanes tracking through here, so what? Okay, I'm serious. This is There's a lot that's been made of this cold look. And it may end up being that it's a very benign season. There's no way to know for sure. But this is not, we don't have that raging El Nino going on over here. If this was really, really, really warm, like 2015, I'd be like, hey, I'll see you guys at the winter storm season starting in December, and I'd just close up shop until then, you know. Uh, just kidding, of course. But this is an interesting pattern evolving, and if we look at it closer, there you go. You know, we're starting to warm it up through the main development region, uh, to at least normal levels. You know, we're not seeing any of these deep blues and purples through here anymore. And even off the coast of the Iberian Peninsula up here, still cold relative to average, but everything's moderating as time goes on. And I find that to be very curious. And we'll monitor that as time goes on. So this too helps us to understand everything that I'm outlining in purple here is warm enough for tropical cyclone activity. Here's your windward and leeward islands through here, Puerto Rico, where the radar is almost fully operational again. Hallelujah. If you've got radar scope, I noticed uh, a tweet from Taylor Trogdon today that, you know, what a beautiful sight or something like that. It's great to see. And, you know, people down there are still really going through a rough time. Uh, and there's a lot of controversy associated with Maria, of course. So that bit of good news, every little bit helps. But... Back to the point here, Western Atlantic, even up through the Gulf Stream here, everything's warm enough to support hurricane activity, and it's only you know a little bit past mid-June. So by the time we get 60 days from now, you bet the Atlantic will be primed for something to happen. Will it be a hyperactive season like last season? I would say probably not, and that's just very hard to do. And you remember 2004, and I'm just saying... That was more of one of those Madoki El Nino events. If memory serves, we'll address this more on Thursday with our special guest. Yes, the Atlantic MDR was warmer in 2004, but that was not a hyperactive season in terms of total name storms. It just happens that a lot of them that formed from Alex, which didn't get started until the end of July and the 1st of August, and then for six weeks it was a siege on the southeast United States. I just, you know, it's like, okay, we'll see. Anyway, I get distracted easily when I think about the past versus what people are thinking for the future. And if stuff doesn't match exactly, it's called confirmation bias. If it doesn't match what they're 
not hoping, you know, nobody's hoping for a hurricane like Maria or Irma, but people that are interested in tracking, if they see these negative factors, they automatically assume that that's it. Kind of like if your favorite three-point shooter in a basketball game is missing three out of you know his first five shots, you're like, ugh. But the rest of the game, he may you know light it up or hit the winning shot at the end of the game. You just never know. There's my basketball and hurricane analogy for the week. Gulf of Mexico, nice and warm, as always, and uh, you know, 29, 30 Celsius, all this green in here, 28 Celsius. So again, the basin will be warm enough, it already is, and it's just going to get warmer from here, which, in terms of beach conditions, I love it. Down here in my neck of the woods, southeast North Carolina, 26, 27 Celsius along the shelf water of the low country down into Georgia, 28 Celsius, so 82 Knocking on the door of 83 degrees in some locations. The Pamlico Sound up here, nice and warm, 26, 27 C. Now, you folks up north, along the Jersey coast and points north of there, Delaware Steve, mm, might want to stay out of the water just a little while longer, unless it's like 98 degrees outside, which it probably is today, and the 72 degree water suits you. Uh, that might be a bit of an extreme contrast for me, but it's going to take a little longer for folks up in the north to really enjoy the beach water like we do down south. But that's also fairly typical. All right, let's move along and see what's happening in the world of what's happening out there in this nice global shot. Nothing out here, of course, which we wouldn't expect this time of year anyway. A little action to men mention and talk about up near the uh, Texas and Louisiana. Louisiana? Louisiana coastal waters, and then Carlotta. I did not give Carlotta much respect, and that's my fault. Uh, but it's hanging around kind of to remind me that I neglected it the other day. So we're going to spend some time. Look at that. This thing is just hanging on. A tropical depression refused and refuses, both in the past and the present progressive, doesn't want to go ashore. So I guess it's just going to kind of die out along the coast of Mexico. That being said, big rainmaker for this area. And, you know, that could be a big problem. So, yeah, time to keep respecting Carlotta. Maybe if I respect it more, it'll eventually go away. Isn't that how things work? It's the quiet ones you have to watch, etc. And now that we're paying attention, it'll eventually dissipate. But there's still some pretty good upward motion there. You can see these clouds bubbling up on this awesome Go16 animation from weathernerds.org and uh, some very heavy rain right along the coast as this just kind of meanders. Now what this will do is this will churn up the water and cool this off. So when we look at this on Thursday, the anomalies map over here, we'll see what that looks like. And in fact, you can see some of the leftover trail of cold from Aletta and Bud. So that takes the heat out, and the more you do that and erode this out, well, the more energy starts to pile up in the Atlantic side that's not disturbed. I'm just saying, we shall see. We have a long way to go. All right, so moving on to the Gulf Coast, all kinds of interesting things to watch. The um, surge of moisture coming in, very impressive, and you can see that coming up through here. Very strong southeasterly surge over that very warm water surface trough in here somewhere, convergence, maybe a little mid-level rotation going on from time to time as storm systems will try to do as they take advantage of the Coriolis force, but too little, too late, going to run out of time for anything with wind of significance and certainly surge. However, the heavy rain threat along parts of coastal Texas and Louisiana, I mean, look at this, some of this moisture coming into southeast Louisiana coming in this southeasterly surge of moisture, very heavy rainfall along the coastal bend, all the way up to the I-10 corridor, across out of New Orleans, Baton Rouge, into the Houston area. So just be mindful of that. Honest to goodness, you got to slow down in these heavy downpours, even if it's just light rain. Please don't drive 70, 80 miles per hour when it's raining. Physics, the laws, of, I don't care what kind of car you drive, how much money is in your bank account, and how many degrees from college you have, or whatever. The laws of physics apply the same to everybody. Just trust me on that, okay? So please take it easy 
while you're out there as this heavy rain comes in. Very little chance that anything develops down here that gets a name, so to speak, so no tropical storm formation expected as far as that goes, but plenty of rainfall from these storms as they roll in, nevertheless, especially up here, look at that, Beaumont, Port Arthur, down to the Houston area, so just be careful out there, it is going to be soggy for a few days. As we look at the GFS, going to put this into motion, the 5,000 foot level of the atmosphere, there's that strong southerly to southeasterly surge just blasting its way out of the Gulf into Texas. Luckily though, no areas of concentrated vorticity seen. In other words, we don't see any round blobs over land. There's a few of them up here. I'm sorry, over the water. This distracted me. That's exactly what I was thinking of. That could be like a little mesoscale feature, one of those MCSs. There's another one. Very active along this sort of ring of fire on the periphery of this very strong area of high pressure that's bringing record heat to some areas and just darn hot for everybody else. But no, no areas of concentrated vorticity over the water out here, and it's over land. That's very interesting. Some of these mesoscale convective complex features that show up and roll across the northern and northwest periphery of this huge area of high pressure, those can put down a lot of rain and gusty winds. So that'll be interesting to watch on social media over the next few days. Let's kill this animation. And look at the Madden Julian oscillation. Anything in the future? Probably not. It's fairly low amplitude right now, phase one through two. But I think this will favor, as we learned from Dr. Ventress last week, more convective activity over Africa and eventually the Indian Ocean, where maybe, if the convection really starts to fire up, the Madden Julian oscillation will take shape again. That'll be fascinating to watch. Also fascinating to me, this is the GFS and its ensemble members. Look how close it matches the Euro. You don't see that very often. Very, very similar. And just a not much MJO activity anywhere to speak of. It's very low amplitude, as you can see here. And what I mean by that is if it was coming out way out like this, it would show you a very strong Madden Julian oscillation event. And as it passes through these particular regions, it leaves a favorable period behind of a couple of weeks or so, and we're just not seeing that. And that's, again, very typical of this time of year. June and July are supposed to be generally quiet in the tropics, and it's interesting, too, because it's quiet everywhere. One little area of interest in the West Pack, but that's about it. Carlotta dying off over the coast of Mexico. Very, very interesting to see the global tropics as quiet as they are. It makes you wonder, will one basin fire up over another as we get to late August and into September? Kind of like last year. But a similar ending, I think. I don't think we'll see the setup that will give us a string of cat fives like we had last year, but we'll see. That is still 60 days away. The beginning of the meat of the season, still 60 days away. Can you believe it? That's, a, that's going to seem like forever, believe me. Um, and we'll just have to figure out something to do between now and then. And that's why I'll do that little thing on Thursday, and we'll bring some other interesting features in as time goes on. I'll look back at some past hurricane events and things like that. And then before you know it, it'll be mid-August, and we'll see what happens. All right, well, that's it for me. We got through a lot today. I appreciate it. I am Mark Seth, HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks, as always, for your time, your attention. And don't forget, subscribe to the YouTube channel. The growth is great. It's awesome. The feedback on the comments is fantastic, and I appreciate it. So subscribe, and then make sure you put that little notification button on so that when I produce a video, you get notified. Have a great rest of your Monday. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.